you want to read along with me this morning in Ephesians chapter 6, I want to talk about this piece of armor, the helmet of salvation. We've been talking about this fight that we fight, and it's such a real fight. I know this morning, just because you come into church doesn't mean that the devil stops fighting you. It doesn't mean that all your problems just disappear when you walk in the doors. That even in our midst as we gather, we have a very real enemy who is fighting to bring us down, to tempt us, to draw us away from what God would have us to do. An enemy that would leave us discouraged, dejected, in despair and in depression. And the Lord understands the reality of this warfare and He inspired the Apostle Paul to give us these words that would be recorded that God has preserved that Christians in every age who will face this adversary would be able to understand how we could go about this battle and actually withstand the greatest enemy you'll ever face, and that's the devil. And we've been told in order to face this enemy that we need to use some used armor. Some armor that's been used. It's already been in the battle. It's been tested. It's been tried. This is the armor of God. The armor that our Lord and Savior Jesus adorned when He came here into this world. And as we've been preaching through the armor, it's been a blessing to me personally as I go into each piece and I say, how did Jesus use this? How did Jesus do this? And I think that'll again be helpful to us today. But this is used armor. We've been told to put all of it on. All of it. We started with the belt of truth and we talked about integrity. The way Satan works is through lies. And the first thing that we're going to need as God's people if we're going to stand against the wiles of the devil is to not play his game. We don't sink to his level. We must have integrity. We must also adorn the breastplate of righteousness which is practical trying to live out what we believe. We've talked about putting on the gospel shoes, which means we need to have a mature understanding of of the gospel and what that means for us. And we talked last week about the shield of faith that can quench all the fiery darts of the devil. And we're going to read this passage again, but we're going to focus this morning with God's help on the helmet of salvation. Paul writes in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And so let's heed that last verse there, and let's pray together before we go further. Father God, today I come to you, Lord, not only on my behalf, but on behalf of all these people that have gathered today to devote some time, Lord, to hear your word, to sing praise, to gather and gain mutual encouragement to pray together, to lift up our voices and our hearts, Lord, to you together. Lord, you've called us to this, and I know that being together is an important thing for us, Lord, and your presence can be with us in such a unique and special way when we gather together. And we pray for that today, Lord. As Brother Kenny prayed earlier, we pray most of all for the presence of your Spirit to work in our midst, Lord, to do that which can't be done by our tongues or our wisdom or anything that we have, but God, you can do miracles among us, Lord, when you are with us. And today, Lord, we pray especially for the strength that your spirit can give, Lord, to grant hope to hearts that need hope. Lord, we understand how important and strong 
a thing that hope is. And I pray, God, that you would open your word to us today, solidify our hearts and minds that we might see your word and understand your word and believe your word, Lord, and feel the hope that you would have us to have today. And for those who don't know you, Lord, I pray they might find their hopes in Christ realized even today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what's a helmet do? What's a helmet do? Even the kids in Sister Linda's class, I got to sit in them with them today. They knew exactly what the helmet does. It protects your head. These helmets that the Roman soldiers wore that Paul was familiar with, they were leather covered with some sort of metal, usually bronze or something else. And they were adorned with a crest so you knew what side you were on. The other soldiers also had a similar crest, and so you could see on the battlefield who your fellow soldiers were, who was on your side, so to speak. These also included a visor and these cheek pieces, perhaps, to protect the face. And they were designed, the Roman helmets were designed to protect the soldier's head from a swing of a double-handed broadsword. That was oftentimes how they would Uh, try to hurt the the army, they would go by and try to decapitate them off of a horse or something like that or or injure their head. And of course, if you take the head out, you can ruin the soldier, even though everything else on his body may be working completely fine. But if you get the head, well, you've, you've taken out the whole soldier. This is the final piece. If you look at this armor, the final piece of the defensive armor, right? Because this last piece of the armor is going to be offensive, The sword of the Spirit. This is the last piece of defensive armor. The helmet of salvation. So how does this work spiritually? As we look at this passage, and I mentioned last week that as Paul is saying, above all, he said, take the shield of faith and then put on that helmet of salvation above all the other things, and then the sword of the Spirit, which would be fastened into the armor as well. So it goes above, in a sense, the other pieces. Take the helmet of salvation. And he doesn't elaborate anymore. We saw the shield of faith quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked, and we read the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So you read about the helmet of salvation, you think, well, what exactly is this? What does it mean? What is it doing? Now, Paul's talking to Christians. He's talking to people who were already saved. So he's not telling them to get saved because they already were saved. And he's telling them, you need to put this on. So it's something that they had to do after being saved. I told you that uh, as Paul was writing this, he was not, I don't think, primarily inspired by the Roman soldiers, but by the Old Testament but by the Old Testament, which he knew well. And no doubt the Roman soldiers helped build the illustration in his mind. But go back with me to Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. We've looked at this passage before when we were talking about the breastplate of righteousness. And if we were to start this passage from the beginning and read all of Isaiah 59, it would sound a lot like Romans 3, which talks about there's none righteous, no, not one. We all have a tendency to lie. Our feet run to evil. We're wicked people. There's none of us that are good. A lot of Romans 3 was inspired by Isaiah chapter 59 where the Lord is looking out on mankind and going, we've got a problem here. We've got a huge sin problem. There's no equity. There's no justice. Who's going to do something about this? And as the Lord was looking out, there's no one who would. Neither was there anybody who could do anything about it because all were corrupt and so the Lord himself said in Isaiah Old Testament Isaiah 59 he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor therefore his arm brought salvation unto him God said I'm going to do something about it and his righteousness it sustained him For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. This is where the helmet of salvation comes from. It comes from Isaiah 59. Jesus, remember this is used armor. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ adorned the helmet of salvation, put on the breastplate of righteousness, came into this world. You can read about the belt of truth earlier in Isaiah. He came into this world. He fought the devil. He went to the cross. He died. He won. He rose victorious. This armor works. Jesus Christ took this job upon Himself. And for this cause, He was born into the world. In fact, that's why His name was Jesus. Jesus means Jehovah saves. That's what the angel said to Joseph. His name shall be called Jesus because He will save His people from their sins. Jesus Christ came with a purpose. He came with a directive of the Father. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave a Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus came with the express purpose of salvation. And you know when you put a helmet on your head, you know it will restrict in some ways your vision and will focus your vision on whatever it is that you're looking toward. And there is a sense in which putting on this helmet of salvation was a sense focusing Christ upon this singular purpose that He had to bring salvation to a lost and dying people who were corrupt, who were bound in eternity for hell. And He came to do something about it. He came with a purpose to bring salvation. And this creates an interesting problem for us. Because we're told to put on the helmet of salvation, right? Well, Christ came and He put on the helmet of salvation. Salvation was His purpose. He was here to bring salvation. And He did that. But that's not my purpose. My purpose is not to bring salvation. My purpose is not to work salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. Most I can do is tell you about it. Right? So I'm different than Him in that sense. How how does the helmet of salvation have any purpose for me? Well, let's go on, and we'll come back to that in a moment, but I want to, to see this helmet in action. I want us to see this helmet in action. I want us to see how Jesus used this purpose of salvation, what He was doing. Jesus was very forward-looking in His ministry. He was very forward-looking. He knew what He came for, didn't He? He had a purpose. And Jesus, from early on in His ministry, started speaking about what? The cross, right? But not just about the cross, right? He just didn't talk about the cross. He would say things like here in John chapter 2, excuse me, John chapter 12, He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat falls into the grounds and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. There's a lot of application to that passage, right? There's a lot of things we could use that passage for. And if you were to think about that passage in your life and you were to read it, what's the first time, and say this is about you in your life, what would your your eye, your mind be drawn to? If you're like me, I would probably look at that and say, I've got to die. I've got to sacrifice. I've got to surrender. I've got to lose things. And our minds would tend to dwell on that. But Jesus didn't just say the the kernel of wheat has to fall into the ground and die. He also looks past that, right? To what will come of it to the purpose, the reason for it. Because if that does fall in the ground and it does die, it will do something. It will produce much fruit. Okay? We have to look past just the grain falling into the ground to see the glorious purpose. What about John chapter 2 where Jesus is speaking to people who were gathered asking him about by what authority that he did certain things. And he said, look, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, they thought he was talking about the physical temple, but Jesus was speaking of the temple in his body. And the first part of that is if you destroy this temple. And that is exactly what was going to happen to Jesus. He was going to go on the cross and he was going to die. But he also looked past the cross, didn't he? 
He looked past the cross to what would happen afterwards. He says, in three days, I will raise it. He saw the cross, but he also saw past the cross to the other side. Now let me give you an even more clear passage that I want us to, I want us to think on this passage today. And, and I want you, I mean, this is a passage I would encourage you to understand and meditate on. I was studying this passage this week, and I, I have a thing where I can write all over the stuff. In my, I have this little remarkable tablet. And I was just writing all around this passage as I was meditating on this because it has such good things for us to take in that can help us a lot. But, but I want to focus on Jesus first in this passage. We'll come back and talk about you and me. But this is this famous passage in Hebrews 12 that builds upon Hebrews 11, which is the hall of faith or the roll call of faith, whatever you want to call it. It goes through and talks about all these Old Testament saints all the way back from Abel down to the ones, you know, the last ones to die in the Old Testament and how these were people of faith and how they were willing to do all these really hard things and they trusted God and God was with them. In some way, shape, or form, God proved himself. And so this chapter 12 pivots based upon all that we've heard and it tells us now as Christians it says wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses all these people who've gone before let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us okay and keep that in mind this it is easy for us to get weighed down with things and sins Amen. it's easy Okay, it is easy for us to get weighed down. And it says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. I believe this passage right here shows us how Jesus wore the helmet of salvation. And I believe it is also teaching us about how we can wear the helmet of salvation and how important this is. It says some important things I've tried to underline on the screen here for you in this passage. Number one, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame. Do not imagine in any way, shape, or form that because He was God, the things that He endured on that cross were anything less than 100% real and horrible. Every bit of that He experienced. And we live in a day where, no doubt if I were to look around here, I could see some people wearing probably some cross necklaces or some cross earrings. And we have a cross back there. And, you know, we magnify the cross. And that's, I'm not being negative about that in any way, shape, or form. But in many ways, we have sanitized the cross. We have sanitized the cross. We have it in gold, we have it in beautiful pictures, and all sorts of things, and we've all been nurtured and raised seeing the cross as something beautiful. And it is, but it's also awful. I mean, if you were a first century Christian wearing around a cross necklace, they would think you were absolutely nuts. Because a cross is a symbol of shame. Cursed is everyone who dies on a tree. You know, to die is bad enough, right? But to do it publicly like that in such a shameful way, in such an agonizing way, as people stood around and watched you and mocked you and all these other things, this was a horrible, horrible way to die. And you have to understand that our Savior did not look forward to that at all. He prayed, right, in the garden. Three occasions asking the Lord if there's any other way 
I mean, if you were to get sick right now, what would you want to do? You probably want to go, right? Who wants to get sick here in front of everybody else, right? When you get sick, you want to go off and be by yourself, right? Get someplace comfortable, as comfortable as you can, or at least not be in front of everybody else where they have to see you when you're just bad off. But my friend, the cross was a public shame. And it was horrible. It was agonizing. Not only what we see physically, but what Jesus spiritually was experiencing with the separation of his father as he took on our sins. I mean, nothing about this was good. But Jesus, his willingness to go to the cross, his willingness to endure this difficult thing, and it uses the word endure, to withstand. He says he despised the shame. He hated it. He hated the shame. How did he do it? It says, for the joy that was set before him. Notice that. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. You see, he looked past the cross. He looked beyond to not the cross and the shame, but what would happen when that grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies? It would produce something good. And he looked toward the joy that was set before him. And through that focus upon the salvation that he was working and the joy of being able to accomplish this and bring children unto himself and being resurrected from the grave and do what? To go and be set down at the right hand of the Father. He looked toward that and as he thought about that, he thought about that time that was ahead of him, he was able to endure the difficulty of that day because he had what? Hope. He had hope. And that setting down that it mentions right there, earlier in Hebrews, the writer says, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. You see, the cross was not his purpose. Hear me. The cross was not his purpose. The empty tomb was his purpose. The cross was the means. The empty tomb was the purpose. The cross was the means that he had to go through, that he despised, that he hated every moment of it. But he was willing to do it for the joy that was set before him. Remember, remember our problem? How does Christ's helmet of salvation work for me? Because I can't accomplish salvation. Salvation is not my purpose. But salvation is my promise. Salvation is my hope. Salvation is my hope. And I want to talk for a few moments here about how significant it is for us to have Hope, right? Hope. What is it? What is hope from a biblical perspective? It's not a wish. We use the word today like wishes. You know, I hope that it's cooler tomorrow. I hope that it's dry. I hope that it's sunny. I hope this or that or the other. I hope this letter comes I've been waiting for. Things like that. We speak about it in terms of wishes. But if you were to look at it in the Bible, it's not just a wish. It's an eager expectation of something. It's an expectation, a confident expectation of something where you are waiting for it. It's like, and I've used this illustration before, it's like the scent of the cookies in the oven. Right? You don't have it on your plate yet, it's not yet in your mouth, but you can smell it. And you know it's going to be good. Right? You get that scent. And that builds a hope. It's a glimpse of the finish line ahead in the distance where you can see it afar off and you know it's coming. What's the difference between faith and hope? 
Well, faith is the belief it will happen. But hope is the joyous anticipation. Hope is something that is tangible, that you can feel. And the scriptures are very careful to distinguish between the two of, you, the two of these things. Why? Because God, because God not only cares about what you believe, He cares about what you feel. He cares about the state of your heart. He is concerned about what's going on with you. You see, God is not satisfied with us being a bunch of robots. He desires your heart. And hope gives us a sense of heartfelt encouragement that we need in a world that seems lost and ruined. That sense of hope. My friends, it makes a powerful difference in our life. Doesn't it? What, what difference does hope make in your life? Have you ever thought about what it is to be without hope? David wrote this in Psalm chapter 27. As he was facing a very difficult situation. Perhaps he was in battle. If you read the rest of the psalm, he talks about how many people in his life had turned on him and betrayed him. And people were against him. He was surrounded by enemies. And he says here in Psalm 27, 13 and 14, he said, I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He said, I would have just given up if I didn't believe that I would still see God proving his steadfast love, his goodness toward me. That, that, that somehow God was going to come along and demonstrate some way in my life that He still cared about me, that He wasn't done with me. I would have fainted if I didn't believe that. He says, then what? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait, why? Wait, because you're hoping for what's not yet come. And so you have to wait. But even while you're waiting for what has not yet come, he says, be of good courage right now. Don't just sit here and wait and go, oh, no, I'm not sure if anything good's going to happen. He says, no, you know who our God is. Wait and be of good courage. Have a, a, a hopeful disposition. How was it that Christ, despite enduring and despising the cross, was able to care about somebody else who was lost beside him, who wanted to go to paradise because of the hope that he had. He told that man, not only will you be in paradise, this day you will be with me in paradise because Jesus Christ had that hope, that eager expectation all the time he was on the cross about where he was headed. Right? Didn't that matter? It matters, doesn't it? You see, David wrote this psalm in distress and he is waiting. He's anchored in hope. You think about the prophet Elijah, a man who was so used by God and he had that great experience on top of Mount Carmel, right? Where, where the prophets of Baal had their altar and cried out to their God to send fire on it and it didn't happen. And then Elijah, you know, had his altar and poured the water on it and God sent down fire from heaven and had all those prophets of Baal slayed, what was it that Elijah wanted? He wanted there to be revival in Israel. He wanted the people's hearts to turn. He wanted the sin, then to turn away from sin and idolatry and turn back to the Lord. I mean, that's what he was all about. And then God even gave him strength to run ahead of King Ahab to go back to his home. And he had to be thinking, oh, God has just moved in such a powerful way. And I ran before the king, you know, now he's listening to me. And he gets there and Jezebel, the king's wife, says, by tomorrow at this time, you're going to be dead. And Elijah went into complete, total despair. He went into the woods, the wilderness, and went under a juniper tree. And he said, Lord, just take my life. Why was he so downcast? Because God had this amazing display of power. And as far as Elijah could see... It did no good. Because God had moved in such a powerful way and it wasn't changing anything. 
Jezebel was still being allowed to do what she wanted and was still going to promote and push out idolatry and the hearts of the people were not going to change. And he went under the juniper tree and said, my life has been for nothing. My ministry has been for nothing. It's all wasted. It's a waste of time. Nothing good. Just take my life. I'm no better than my father's is what Elijah is crying out because he is without hope. I mean, the man still had his intellect, right? He still had his body. He still had strength, right? He still had all of those things, but despite having all that he had physically, his head was off, right? His head was off. He had no hope. He had no hope, and so he was in this place of just total despair. And the Lord did what? The Lord strengthened him. The Lord brought him to Mount Sinai. The Lord told him, I still have a purpose for you. Here is what I'm going to do. I still have people who have not bowed to Baal. He gave Elijah all these things that he needed to know and believe and understand so Elijah could have hope and continue to go. Because that's all that Elijah needed. He just needed hope. Right? He was knowledgeable in the word. He had a heart to be faithful to God. He just needed hope. What about the Apostle Paul? What did he say? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, he said, look, essentially I've made a lot of sacrifices in my life and I have stood against heresy and people trying to twist and pervert the gospel. He gets down to this verse in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if after the manner of men I have fought with the beasts at Ephesus, what advantages, what advantageth, advantageth it me? What, what good has it done me? If the dead rise not... Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Paul said, look, if there is no resurrection to look forward to, all of our sacrifice, all of our service, all of our time here is wasted. Just go live it up. Just go live it up in the world. Live your best life now, because that's all you got if there is no hope on the other side of the grave. But there is, right? Amen. You, see how, you see how important that hope is to like everything that we do? That hope and that expectation? Let's go back to that passage in Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to look at it from our perspective because we looked at it from Jesus. And we saw how he put on that helmet that he looked forward past the cross for the joy that was set before him, and he endured the cross, despising the shame. It's telling us now, wherefore seeing we are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, all the ones who've gone before us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Sometimes the weight is our despair. It's our discouragement. He says, he says weight and sin, Right? Sometimes there are things that we carry in our lives that aren't necessarily specifically sin, but it's our disposition. It's our lack of hope. It's our lack of belief, of really tasting and seeing. Let's lay that aside and let us run with what? Patience. Why? Because this is a weight. This is a long road. This is a hard road. And there is no instant gratification for us on this side. There are many things that we've had to do and seeds we've had to sow and watering we have to do that may produce fruit after we're dead and gone. Sometimes we've done things and we have no idea what good it's done and we're not going to know till the sweet by and by, right? Amen. And so we have to labor and we have to, to do all these things in hope, in expectation of what God is going to do with it. Until then, we have to have patience. And sometimes this road down here is very, very hard. So we're called to run with patience. How? By looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. And I want to tell you three ways that we can look unto him. We talked about how he is the author and finisher of our faith and how he endured the cross. Look at the, in that last verse, verse 3. Consider him. Again, it's drawing our minds to him. Think upon Jesus that endured such 
contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You see what's, what we're concerned with here? This is about the state of our hope. And how is it that we put this helmet of salvation on? We look to Jesus three ways. Number one, He is our example. He's the one who wore it first. He did it. It worked. He was able to endure the horrors of the cross by looking past that toward what lied ahead. And so number one, he has shown us by his example how to do it. But he is also, most significantly, he is our Savior. Jesus is not just our example, but he, Jesus, is our Savior. He has purchased, for those of us who've been saved, he has purchased eternity with Him in paradise. He has purchased a place for us in which there is no more death, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no weakness, no sickness. And every one of us, every one of us who have been saved, we carry that promise. Paul writes about it in Romans chapter 8. He says in verses uh, 23 through 25, he says, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, who have the Spirit of God in us because we've been saved. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope for what a man sees why would he hope for it? You don't hope for what you already have. You hope for what you're waiting for. But if we hope for that, we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. This wait, it says, we groan in our bodies at times as we wait. Because the wait is painful. But the pleasure to come it's palpable. It's tangible. We can know it. We can feel it. As the quartet sang this morning, the midnight cry, I was sitting there thinking about that. And as this passage says, and maybe you can relate to this, in some way you were sitting there and you were hearing about this day that is to come and the thoughts of the graves being emptied of those who have trusted in Christ of the urns holding the, the cremated remains of those who trusted in Christ being emptied, emptied. And then we which await going to be with them in the air and forever being with Jesus. And could you feel it? Could you feel it? I mean, was there not a yearning? I mean, more than just like, oh, I believe that's going to happen, but something it does in your heart as you hear that and you think about that. And the hope that we have and that, it, that it's worth continuing to go on. It's not just something we believe, but it's something we can feel and know in our heart of hearts and at times be so encouraged and lit up by that in the midst of darkness and difficulty and despair. In a place where we've not seen people rise from the dead. But yet we can have hope and we can feel about that, can't we? We can feel about that. You see, they were up there here, as they were singing, they were ministering hope to us. They were ministering hope. How important is that for you? I know it's important to me. I think it's important for all of God's people to have our hope rekindled in our hearts and, and not just about what lies ahead. But what Jesus accomplished on the cross is not just what He's going to do with us someday, but what He can do with us right now and that His redemption is for our very lives so that we in our weakness, we, even if we didn't get saved till later in years, 
even though we may have physical illnesses, even though we may not have all the opportunities or the means or whatever of somebody else, but that Jesus Christ can redeem our life. He can make our life matter. Even our difficulties, as in Romans 8.28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. We can know this. And we can feel, we can have hope in the midst of doing whatever I'm doing that some way God has ordained this even in my difficulty, even in my cancer, even in my illness or my weakness, even though I lost my job, even though this or even though that, God can use this in some way so that it matters, that it furthers His cause because He can redeem anything. And so even in the midst of a dark situation, we can have hope right? We can have hope that God would redeem it because that's what Jesus Christ accomplished on that cross, the ability to redeem everything. We look unto Jesus because he is our example. We look unto Jesus because he is our savior. We look unto Jesus because he is our prize. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. My friends, we Oh, that we could get a glimpse, a glimpse in our hearts of hearts of the majesty and the glory and the goodness of Jesus Christ. It fills us up and can surpass any other pleasure or joy or goal of achievement in this life. Christ himself. And my friends, he has given himself for us to make us a people unto him. And the love that he has for us knows no bound and no end. And my friend, that is exactly what he plans to do to us in eternity is to give himself to us forever and ever and ever. He is our prize. He is our portion. The Lord told Abraham as he gave up the riches of Sodom and Gomorrah after rescuing them, he wouldn't take a bit from them. And the Lord came to Abraham that next day and he said, Lord, or he said, Abraham, fear not. I am your shield and I am your exceedingly great reward. He told Abraham, he said, I am your reward. You're going to get all of me. You didn't lose anything by turning away from the riches of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's look at one more passage and we'll close. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul wrote about this armor again. A little bit differently. Didn't write about all of it. But he says here in this passage, it's an important passage for us to look at. As he writes to the Thessalonians. He says, but let us who are of the day save God's children. Let's be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. You see how he elaborates a little bit more there in that passage? For a helmet put on the hope of salvation. For... Because God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, when he comes back, right, we should live together with him. Then what's he tell us to do? Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even also, even as also you do. He says, put on as a helmet that hope of salvation. Because if you know the Lord, you are not destined for wrath. You are destined to be in His presence So comfort each other with this truth. One of the most important things we can do as we gather together is to minister that hope to each other, to remind each other of the good promises of our God, that those things are not just things that we believe and can recite, 
but that those are the things that the Spirit of God causes us to actually feel. Because we all need hope. We all need hope. You can have everything else in your life going so well, but if you lose hope, everything can fall apart. But My friend, we have a blessed hope. We have a good God and Savior. If you don't know Him, if you've not come to know Christ, if you've not come to understand what it is to have your burden of your sin taken away and forgiven and to know that peace and to be given those promises so that you can have hope, my friends, He is willing to save. He wouldn't go to the cross and die for your sins and then play, try to play hide the ball with you. But He has made Himself available to all who would seek Him with all their heart. Amen. All your heart. Seek Him with all your heart. That's what He requires. You look to Christ alone and you seek Him with all of your heart. And nothing will be withheld from you. As we stand and sing today.